So today we're going to talk about actually two syndromes, rotator cuff and thoracic outlet syndrome. And there's a huge amount of crossover between these two. And quite often patients will come in and they go, I've been diagnosed with a rotator cuff problem. Could you get in there, free up this particular muscle and I'm sure things will turn out great. Well, maybe. Okay, so we're going through, obviously we're gonna do a complete orthopedic and neurological examination. We're gonna look through things, but we're not just gonna look at some of the standard tests. We're gonna make sure that we don't have problems that are more vascular, neurological, and you know, be a little more, a little wider in terms of our assessment. So, some of the obvious things in terms of rotator cuff, we may have a you know a painful arc going up. We're going over certain orthopedic tests. Just resist this, Mickey. Good. And we're going through like an empty can or full can test. Running through a whole series, which we do have videos on, which I'll actually link to, and I'll put them in this video. But we're also going to take a look at different things and go, okay, is this individual having problems in terms of, let's say, the ulnar nerve? So we'll get down there and we'll check, just really slightly pull this back between the fourth and fifth digits, or maybe along the flexor carpi ulnaris, you notice that they're actually getting altered sensation or weakness down here. And they say, well, maybe this is something else going on in here. So maybe it's not just the rotator cuff. Or I'll feel their hands and I'll notice that there's quite a temperature change from one side to the other. This is a common one that's missed. So we'll start to expand our analysis a bit to see what's going on. So when we're actually going through the initial examination, one thing I want to mention is to always check respiratory rate. Yes, we go through and we go, okay, this person's got normal temperature, their blood pressure's fine. And you go, okay, maybe their breathing is a little bit faster, but let's go beyond that. And there's some really important reasons why we're going to do this with these particular syndromes. So, Mickey, why don't you take a, uh, just kind of talk a little bit about the difference between a chest breather, abdominal breather, and why these factors are even important. Yeah. So a chest breather is going to be someone who just focuses on basically breathing with their chest. It's going to be more upper back. It's going to be more shoulders. Mm -hmm. So what that looks like is just the chest is rising, mm -hmm. just the chest is falling, but typically the stomach is going to stay fixed. Right. And then a belly breather, we're going to focus on not moving the chest and we're going to focus on breathing through the belly or the lower part of the lungs. Mm -hmm. So for that, it's going to be a softer abdomen. The abdomen comes out. Abdomen comes back in. Now, when we're doing more of the upper respiratory, we're actually not going to be getting that full lung breathing in. Right, so they're going to be faster instead yeah. of like a 12 to 14 sure. ratio per minute. That could be like an 18 or a 22, something yeah. like that. Very, very short <laughs> breaths. Now, why this is so important when it comes to uh, both rotator cuff and thoracic outlet syndrome is when you're in that fast respiratory state, you're actually driving the sympathetic nervous system. So, fight and flight responses, increasing stress hormones such as cortisol, driving pro-inflammatory pathways. So it's actually very hard to get over a lot of chronic conditions if you're doing this. So one of the key things is, you're gonna put this back in your mind somewhere, I have to make sure that I actually prescribe breathing exercises to this patient at some point. Otherwise, all the soft tissue work I do and the adjustments I make, everything else and even the exercises may not work. And this is, this is a, a point that's commonly missed I mean, I've seen patients who, you know, they come in and they say, that I'm doing everything right. And yet they're upper chest breathers and they're just driving this sympathetic pathway. You slow it right down. We get to about, oh, maybe five or six breaths per minute to the point where the simple exercises, we have them breathe through their nose. They have them put their tongue on the back of their teeth on the upper palate and breathe in and out very slowly. At first it may be five or six breaths, but eventually we can get them down so they're actually breathing in for four and letting it out for eight counts and slowing it right down. Then we really get into actually tapping into the parasympathetic nervous system. So after we've actually done analysis, we figure out whether this person is has short respiratory function, they're breathing too fast, we're gonna make a little note to slow that down. We'll get into some manual therapy. So when we're doing analysis, we're gonna look through the shoulders, you okay there, Mickey? Oh yeah. Looking for tension through the traps, back posterior rhomboids, but we're also going to get forward here. You okay? Oh, yeah. You got me palpating the area? Yeah. So, you know, subclavicular, a little tight there. Mm -hmm. Cross pecs. Okay. Making sure we're checking both sides here. And that's the key thing. Just because the injury is on one side does not mean that you 
you have to actually analyze both sides and provide appropriate care. Now, this will be different care depending upon the individual. I'm just going to move your hair a little bit there. But really important too to check up in terms of the suboccipital region all the way down the cervical region. You okay? Okay. Okay. Because we are one kinetic chain. What happens in the shoulder, we have to look at above and below. So when it comes to the ribs and not looking at respiratory function, take a deep breath in. Right, and up. It's interesting, sometimes when you're doing this, you're looking at your thumbs back here, but you'll find that one side will expand more than the other. And there's actually particular exercises for breathing that are gonna to help to even out the person. Good, you okay? Mm -hmm. And out, good. So let's just go through a few manual release procedures. What I would actually do is I would be analyzing four or five different structures in the area, and depending on what I found, I would treat those structures. You'll see that we have certain protocols to address each of these, but we're only going to use the protocols that are, are needed. Just have you bring your shoulder up here. You okay? Okay. Just take your arm a little bit there. Good. Down. Take it right up. Bend your elbow. Right back. Doing okay there? Yeah. Just feel like a good stretch. Though. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm just making sure that the scapula is gliding. I've got a good two to one ratio here. If I find a problem there, I'll get on that. I'm going to have you lie on your side, please, facing over. And I mentioned whenever we have a problem with the rotator cuff, we also have to check and make sure the ribs are okay so I get in between the serratus anterior and latissimus dorsi. Doing okay? Yep. Good. It's not bad. I can get you to lie on your back, please. Okay, you working on the front here a little bit? Yeah. Okay. I'm actually going to have you come right over the edge here. Good. And let me just take this up here and down. Good. Not too bad there, eh? No. Okay. So in Mickey's case here, I'm not that concerned, but really important to check out pectoralis minor, subclavius, also getting on to the scalene, sternocleidomastoid. All of these structures here will have a tendency to actually lock right down if we have a person who is basically an upper chest breather. What will also happen is the shoulders will start to roll in on both sides. The head will move forward and that anterior carriage of the head will put a lot of stress on the whole upper back region there. Okay, let's move back to the center, please. So what's also really important is if we're dealing with the soft tissue structures, is to also look at the osseous structures. So we have to look at the ribs, we have to look at excursion of the facet joints in the mid-thoracic area. Have the shoulder here, you mind if I just palpate here and see what's... Okay, well actually you're kind of locked up in here. <laughs> Bring it back down there, breathe in. Good, one more time. That was a nice release. Oh yeah. Okay. Now, let's take a look at a few acupuncture points. So I just want to mention something that's really powerful in working on the shoulders or any area in the body is actually tapping into some acupuncture points. We call these fascial expansions. We're basically you're going to get in, if it's within your scope of practice, you could use needles or just actually getting in and massaging the area, but really needing it. So let's say, for example, we get to what we call um, small intestine 15. So on the upper back, we're gonna go right down to the border of C7, and then we're gonna just move over about so far from that, and in Chinese medicine, it would be too chun, and then I would get on this area. You feel that, Mickey, right there? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go on both sides here, just kinda of right there. Feeling that right there? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I feel that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Now, this is really powerful for releasing tension throughout both the cervical region and the shoulders. 
So I'm also gonna, get, while we're here, I'm just gonna move up a little bit and I'm gonna get um, to what they call GV16. And this is on the midline between the nape of the neck, just below the external occipital protuberance down here. There we go, right there. You okay? Yeah. Feel that quite a bit, don't you? Yep. Yeah. So again, we can release a lot of tension to the shoulders. We'd actually stimulate these for maybe a minute or two, but if you found tension in the area, especially in the extremities in acupuncture, some really interesting information that's come out of traditional Chinese medicine combined with some of the research in the fascial world. Um, a lady called Helen Langevin at Harvard University has shown there's about a 90% correlation between acupuncture points of the extremity and fascial thickenings. So I can actually feel the thickenings in all these areas. Okay, make you take a deep breath in and just let it out slow. So anytime we get on these acupuncture points, get your patient to go through this and just breathing in slow, letting it out slow. <laughs> this is pretty wild. Actually, as soon as you started doing that, mm -hmm. this, yeah. just let, this just let go. Yep. <laughs> it's just wild. Okay, good. So these are areas which are going to help quite a bit in terms of releasing the shoulders, but we could also go to the shoulder blade itself. And there's several points here that we could release, but while we're here, why don't we just get on your hand here. Let me see your hand. And I'm going to get on a little point here, which is large intestine four. It's on the dorsum of the hand. And this one will actually reduce the amount of pain a person is experiencing throughout the entire body. It's pretty wild. They've done some pretty amazing experiments using functional MRIs and looking at brain activity while stimulating this particular point, large intestine four, or Hoku. Is that tender at all or? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's see your other hand. Okay, let's get on this one. This mm -hmm. one, at not as tender? No. It doesn't feel as like you've got the same thickening there. Yeah. So what I want to see here is when I'm stimulating this point here, take a deep breath in and let it out. Let it out. Good. So one thing is I want to mention is that if we do have indications of neural impingement or neural tethering, for example, in the shoulder, one of the most common things is actually the ulnar nerve, as I mentioned, coming down here. Therapy-wise, we'd also do some release of that. Good. But we'd also combine this with specific exercise protocols. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add an ulnar nerve flossing video. The link to that below so you can actually see that you're feeling that aren't you down over, back down back over down now the wild thing about palpation is if you get in there you can actually feel where some of the nerves are for example there we go got a muscle here called pronator tear so I go between that between the muscle I can actually feel the median nerve between that as I bring the fingers down here, I can actually feel that median nerve translating through the tissue. And I can feel my three fingers going tingly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of know you're on the right spot. Mm -hmm. But for the practitioner, it's really important they have a tactile sensitivity to actually get in, feel where the nerve is, go on the side of the nerve and pull it through the tissue. And almost immediately, quite often you can get changes. It doesn't matter in your lower extremity, upper extremity. This is really, really powerful work. Nikki, why don't you talk about some of the exercises actually that are important for this? For the thoracic outlet syndrome? Well, kind of the combination. The combination, yeah. yeah. So we've, we've got some videos obviously in terms of mobility, strengthening, there's some ones, and we, we do a combination of uh, mobility exercise, strengthening exercise, yeah. and balance proprioception. Gentle range of motion, isometrics. Yep. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. But the biggest thing is gonna be the breathing again. It is, yeah, yeah, it is. You really want to focus again on telling your patient about breathing and the importance of diaphragmatic breathing versus mm -hmm. that upper chest breathing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because a person can come in, they can go through all the therapy, they can go through everything, and we get some you know, great practitioners, work on people, mm -hmm. and the results are good, but not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Because they keep going back to these old patterns, and what's driving that pattern is their breathing. Yeah. Okay, and that's driving that pro-inflammatory reactions, it's increasing sympathetic activity. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, you should do a little bit of analysis and start asking questions about their diet. 
you know, a lot of people come in and they, you know, horrible diets, all junk food, nothing is, yeah. you know, nothing green in their diet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, raw, no raw vegetables, no raw fruits, things like that. A lot of yeah. processed fruits or overly processed foods. Yeah, that they definitely don't help when you want to have oh, some no. anti-inflammatory diet. Most right. definitely. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with having an occasional glass of wine. Yeah, but having two or three drinks every night is probably not a great idea either. And ten cups Everything, of coffee. Yeah, 10 cups of coffee. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy a good cup of espresso in the morning, but we grind the beans right there so they don't oxidize. It's not bitter. It tastes great. It's funny. It, it, it feels so different yeah. as compared to if you're, you know, nothing against uh, certain places, but if you show up and you get drip coffee some of these places, you're wired for hours. Yeah, your heart's, oh, your hearts. Oh, yeah, you got that yeah. secondary heart stuff going yeah. on. You know, just realize this, this is keeping this condition going. Yeah, okay. 100%. So we go through all this stuff and we look at this. We have to realize we have to come up with an individualized plan. And we have to look at this person. You know, are they uh, quite overweight? And why that's even important is because, unfortunately, a lot of the visceral fat in your body also produces more cortisol. Mm -hmm. And that could drive that pathway. So slow, sustainable changes over a long period of time. Nothing too radical. I try to get people so they don't go on any radical diets or anything. Just good, healthy eating, good food, staying well hydrated. You know, all, all this stuff is incredibly important. But quite often, it's a combination of different types of therapies. And sometimes you have to get um, sort of do multidisciplinary types of treatments where we have to work in conjunction with their MD, their dentist, while well, patients come in and they say it, it hurts too much to do the exercises. Well, if they took certain medications short term, they might be able to do it. They need to get to sleep. People that are only sleeping three, four hours a night, I mean, they're just not. Never going to recover. No, they're not. Yeah. They're not. So this whole thing I talk about when it's like taking a technological break in the evening yes. from about 10 o'clock till 6 in the morning. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. lots of you know young people who uh, basically have really bad headaches or shoulder problems, musculoskeletal stuff. Mm -hmm. And what do they do? They go to bed with their cell phone. Yes. And then they're on their cell phone for two or three hours every night and say, I can't sleep. Jeez, yeah. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This is really, really powerful work though. So look through this. I'm going to provide you with a lot of different links in this particular video down below. So please check them out.